not really. <laughs> Good. I, good. They didn't record that. Um, so this is the uh, this is our final competition for the year, best of the year. So uh, everybody's uh, holding their breath, except me, because I don't think I'm in there this year. Am I, Vince? You are. Uh, we have a couple, a couple of quick announcements. Um, there's uh, the hol holiday lights uh, presentation next Monday on the fourth with Val Hoffman. Bob, you um, you got muted. Unmute yourself, Bob, mm. and repeat that. Jeff. All right, now can you hear me again? Now I can. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Okay. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why we keep getting muted. Um, next Monday is uh, Valerie Hoffman's holiday lights presentation, and she's offering a workshop up at uh, Christmas Village. So you, you have that information in, in the newsletter. So if you're interested, she's going to limit it to, I think, 10 people. So first 10 people, and there's a small charge for uh, for that workshop. So that's that's coming up, and check your newsletter for that. The other, th the other big thing is our Santa uh, shoots. We have two of them. What were the dates? 9th and 16th, right? And we don't have a big list of volunteers yet. I know a lot of people are planning on volunteers, volunteering for that. But Kim's getting a little nervous. She's sitting back there, bouncing her feet up and down. She's really nervous. We have a Santa for both days, which uh, Marshall found us a a fireman Santa. So, and 28 years he's been Santa. And we have a regular Santa at the fairgrounds. So we're set with that. The only thing is we need uh, we need bodies to run the show up there. So if you're willing to spend a couple hours with us, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it will be well worth it. It's it's one of our bigger uh, um, fundraising events of the year too. So we're that's where we get uh, some funds, right? The other thing is our members members meeting in December. Hey, again, all this is in your newsletter, so check your newsletter. Um, we need bodies for that too, bodies to volunteer for the board, and bodies to you know look over our our plan for next year and input for next year. So that's coming up uh, in in the third third Monday of December. Um, memberships they're coming in, but we want them to flood in. So if you haven't renewed, or if you have somebody who's interested and they're on the fence about joining us push them over the fence our way um, because we'd like to have the renewals before the end of the year. Okay. We've had, uh, we've had a good response so far, but uh, uh, we need everybody back in, into the fold uh, so that we can start budgeting for next year. Jeff is, uh, has agreed to put together our, our journeys slideshow uh, members uh, slideshow for that meeting. And Jeff, I can't remember all the details. Give us the deadline. The deadline is next Friday, the, whatever that date is. The 8th. The 8th? December 8th. Yeah. December, December 8th. Yeah. The 8th, 8th at midnight. So, at midnight. Yep. So please get them in by then. Uh, after that, I won't be looking for them. Mm -hmm. and then the yeah. other thing, just please do your best to follow the directions i had four submittals and three i have to fix so that's not too bad i mean three some are double some are misnamed some are extras uh so just take a little care when you do it because it'll save me a lot of work especially when they all come in on the eighth the, the directions will be listed again, and this this coming Friday's newsletter will have all the directions again. Yeah, they're but really last... not really not hard. Just don't put extra dashes in. Don't put underscores. Don't change your name. Don't submit them twice. We'll do good. That's the okay. easiest thing. And that, and that's and that's the highlight of our meeting. So we want a lot of images up there. So I think we have three or four submissions so far. Yeah, there's four. Last I looked. Okay, yeah. only four. Okay, that's for the journey. Yes. Um, anybody else have any announcements? Vince, do you have anything? Ginny? No, I think um, we've covered it. And look forward to the um, 
newsletter in December will have the full 2024 calendar that Marshall and I have been working on. And, and I think there will be a newsletter then, this, right? this coming Friday. Okay. So tonight we're going to um, be doing our best of the year event. Um, and Henry Rowan will be our judge for the fourth year in a row with this particular event. Um, the images from tonight had received awards in our prior three competitions for 2023. Um, and of those um, that get awards tonight, um, there'll be 16 of them, uh, 15 picked by Henry um, will be submitted to the 2024 Michael Day International Competition that we've been involved in for well over, I think, 15 years or so. Burke's um, Photographic Society ran it last year, 2023, and Finland is running it this year. And we have uh, a total of five international, uh, five countries uh, involved, including us. So for tonight, uh, Henry was given uh, these images um, blinded with no identification factors uh, on the images or on his scoring sheet. Um, and uh, we'll run through those uh, very shortly. Uh, Henry Rowling is well known by many of us uh, in our organization and um, throughout Pennsylvania and nationally. Henry is a um, um, national award-winning professional photographer. Um, he did a lot of corporate photography in the past, started professionally in the 1970s. Um, at this point, uh, Henry is a frequent lecturer and judge. Uh, his focus has been mainly in the last several years on uh, teaching, writing, and trying to create new creative artistic images. Um, there are a couple links uh, to Henry in our uh, recent number of newsletters. Uh, Henry was the founder and director of the Pennsylvania Center of, for Photography in Dorristown, which is on pause at this point. Um, but Henry has been a great friend um, through that and other involvements uh, with the Berks Photographic Society. And many of us uh, know Henry pretty well and have done some really nice coursework with Henry. So Henry, thank you so much for um, doing this for us for the fourth time. And I already have you scheduled, Henry, for next year. Uh, Maybe so, we should wait. <laughs> if you want to say a few words, Henry, um, and then um, we can start with the um, uh, competition for tonight. Well, thanks, Vince. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I like doing this show because all the images are good. So they've, they've all been sort of, um, uh, what's the right word? They're, they're all good images. They're all solid images rather than having to uh, deal with stuff that's really needs a lot of work. So this is a fun show to to do. With that said, since they're all good images, the judging is really, really personal. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's what I like. It's not what I think is the best. Uh, it, it is what I think is the best. But if, if you disagree, disagree, because that's fine. Um, it's just mine is just one opinion. I'll have some suggestions later. Uh, I'm going to do some edits on some of the images. You may totally disagree with the way I would do the edits. That's also fine. I, I just want to make make clear that, you know, photography is a very, very personal uh, art form. And hopefully as, as people get better and more experienced, they're going to start to really um, take images that reflect their personality, their desires, their needs, and whatever that is, is okay. If you're okay with the image, that's all that matters. I have images that I dearly love that people trash all the time. They don't understand them. They don't like them. And I don't care. And I want you guys to take that same attitude too. It's your artwork. You are the only one that matters unless you're trying to sell it. If you're trying to sell it, then the game changes. Okay, then you have to find a market for your images. But for the purposes of tonight, if you like the images the way they are, that is absolutely fine. I'm going to present my point of view. Hopefully, it will give you some ideas. And that's all we're really looking to do. Um, so, and, and I've said this before to this group, I've been married a very long time, so I know I am always wrong. 
So, um, you know, just <clears throat> just remember that I accept I accept that as a part of my existence. Um, so, on that note, we can do whatever you'd like to do, Vince. Okay, I will screen share. <clears throat> we'll start up um, uh, with Class A um, Nature. Um, and um, I hope everyone can see that. Do you see my screen, Henry? Yes, I do. Okay. So the um, I just wanted to give you these two examples. Um, this is how uh, Henry received the images uh, labeled as one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, and this is Henry's scoring sheet. No names, um, totally de-identified. So we'll start with the uh, the first image. Um, this is Foggy Morning by Ivan Bubb. Yeah, this is, this is a very, <clears throat> very nice image. This is one that we're going to work on, I think, I have to remember. The, the problem with working in fog is getting enough contrast to make the image pop. And one of the things I guess I should have said up front is when you're creating an image, you have to look and see, let me just get rid of this little thing on the screen. Um, you have to decide where you're going to be showing your image, how you're going to be showing it. So this image, the way I would approach it is I would come up with a base image and then I would have a version for digital and I would have a version for print. To me, the ultimate expression of a photograph is a print. It's not a digital image. But I acknowledge that the world is changing around me. So, you know, I do both. When you're creating an image, leave yourself some room to adjust for the medium you're going to be showing it in. This one is, I like the, the subject. Shooting in fog is always tough. The shooter did a great job uh, with this. I think there's a little bit more contrast that you have that can make it pop. The other thing with reflections that you need to be a little bit careful of is reflections tend to divide the image in half. And generally doing that puts a horizon line in the middle, which is technically not a great place to put a horizon line, but it works in this case and, and it's a very nice image. This is a well executed. Two, excuse me, Contemplation 2 is the title, and this is by Julie Stauffer. Nice image. I like that it was shot on black. It really pops off the screen. Um, the, the sharpness is good. Uh, the layout is good. It's, it's a, a well done, well shot image. Um, shooting flowers like this is, is fun. I've done lots and lots of flowers over the years. Uh, they present some unique challenges. And the shooter on this one did a good job of handling those challenges. Nice shot. Spring's first blooms. This is again. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This sorry, Jimmy. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, this is, and, and I apologize. I'm used to the 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 judging where we just pop it on the screen without too much of an introduction. I'll I'll, I'll shut up after each one. Uh, nicely done. Uh, everything that needs to be sharp is sharp. The background is. The only thing that I would probably see if I could find a different angle for, it's a little bit on the brown side. The flowers themselves are perfect. Um, I love the water on them. The focus is great. The background leaves me a little bit cold. There might have been a different angle. Maybe there wasn't. It's a good shot no matter what. Um, when you're doing these, you know, especially flowers, to me, the background is the critical element. When I'm shooting flowers, I actually find the background first and then work the flower into it. Because it's, in general, except for the one right before it where you have a black background, the the impact of the background on floral photography is enormous. Um, but this is a, a nicely shot uh, and very great flowers. I love them. The Power of Light, Vince Pellegrini, and this got first place. This is a wonderful shot. Um, I'm actually uh, 
when I went through them today to choose which ones I wanted to edit, I actually chose this one because this is a great shot. And this is kind of a prime example of one that you want to make multiple versions of because working in black and white for a digital screen and working in black and white for print are two totally separate entities. I mean, the files can be far, far apart. My favorite black and white that I've ever done, actually, if I showed you the print version of it, would look like absolute crap on, on a digital projector. Um, but this is nicely done. Um, if I was going to have any criticism of this, what I would do is say probably like a little bit more foreground, um, but the the detail is well held and the clouds are just great. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about this that makes this different is I'm not sure what the exposure is on this, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere between one and three minutes, which messes with the clouds in a very, very nice way. It streaks them out. Um, Vince, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but that's that's what I thought when I looked at it, that you had a, a timed exposure in midday, which is never easy to pull off. Yeah, it's, it was a two-minute exposure. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I, I thought it was something in there. Um, <clears throat> and it's something that people might want to try on a more regular basis. In the old days, before you had mirrorless cameras, working with neutral density filters or extensive neutral density filters could be very, very difficult because once you put them on, you can't see anything. And doing it like this with neutral density filters on mirrorless cameras is much, much easier. And it Olympus actually has the best system for handling neutral density filters because you can watch the image grow in the background um, as you're shooting it, rather than having me guess at what your exposure is. But this is nicely done. Uh, congratulations, Vince. Thank you. Power by Tom Story. This is a nice image, too. Um, I, I like water shots uh, a lot. There, there is some hotness in some of the water, and there's some uh, detail that's been lost in the shadows. But it's a good capture. Um, you have to decide right uh, out, off the bat whether you're going to blur the water or whether you're going to freeze it. <clears throat> the faster you go, the more you're going to freeze the water. In general, on something like this, you're going to need at least uh, one three thousandth of a second at a minimum. And getting up closer to an eight thousandth of a second is, is going to be where you want to be. Uh, but this was nicely captured. Regal Eagle by Mark Searfoss, and this got a third place. Nice eagle shot. Um, very clear. Uh, I think I chose this one, too, to do a little bit of work on. And the only thing I would say is, and I think I, I'm pretty sure I did it. If not, I'll add it in. You can make this pop a little bit more. And that that's true of pretty much every image here. There, there's more to be gained from them. You can get a little bit more out of them. Um, and in this case, what I suspect is you're gonna see very, very minor changes make a big difference in how the image is perceived. And that by that, I mean that you're gonna get a lot more depth out of the image um, with just a few minor modifications. So it's a nice shot. Oh, sorry. And shooting birds is never easy. Tracking them is never easy. Uh, and you did a great job. Pure White by Jenny Lodge. This is what I meant by capturing the background, how important the backgrounds are. Uh, beautiful job in blurring them out. The background, to me, has as much interest as the flower does. Um, it works very, very nicely. It's um, exactly how I would have shot this image, and it's 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 well done. Nice job. Dawn by Julie Stoffer. 
this is a great image as well. And at the same time, it's one of those images that has the appearance of being slightly on the, the flat side. There's more of it to be pulled out of this image. This is also a tough image to work with because you've got two things that are working against you. One is the, the th what makes this work is the sun and the sun rays and the misty, the misty air. And on the other hand, that's the thing that makes it hard to work with because you're already uh, at the upper end on, if you look at a histogram, you're already blowing off the histogram on the right-hand side. <clears throat> so how do you get that back and maintain uh, a contrast range that makes it, makes it pop off the screen a little bit more? Tough image to work with, uh, always fun to shoot in the early morning. The sun will rise. Bob Gross. Good image. The composition on this is very good. Um, the, the only issue that I would have with this is the tree in the foreground on the, in the upper left-hand side. It's actually in the mid-ground. I'd like to see a little bit sharper. Um, that's a tough focus. On something like this, what I would generally do is I'd focus stack it and I do it manually. Um, I found that you know a lot of the cameras today will do focus stacking for you. I just found it faster, easier, and more reliable to do it myself. Um, and I'd like to see that tree, you know, a little bit sharper, a little bit cleaner. Uh, always fun to work in the morning. It's uh, well shot. Morning mist. Vince yep. Sabrini, and this got honorable mention. There, this shot has a lot more. This is, I love the uh, design on this. It's very well seen. There's a little bit more uh, pop that can come out of it that I think would uh, really make this explode off the screen a little bit more. And I would suggest to you that if you tried to print this, it would be in its current form you'd find that it flattens out on you kind of badly. Um, things like this are very difficult to print properly. So you've got to be, you got to be really careful on things like this. Fog is tough to work with, uh, both when you're shooting it and when you're printing it. So I think I'm, I think this is another one I suggest, uh, selected. The universe in his eyes. Jenny Lodge, and this got second place. Yeah, this is a cool shot. Um, the thing that I really like about this, and what's so unusual, is how tight it is. But the eyes are in focus, the top of the head is in focus, and whatever those things are called that come out and grab the butterflies as they float on by, uh, and his teeth are in focus. Really well done. Technically, this is a very nicely shot uh, praying mantis. Um, nice job, Jenny. Perfect Perch by Jackie Henney. Um, I, I think this is great. Um, the My only complaint with this one is the positioning uh, of the bug. It's nearly dead center. I think that I would look at uh, different croppings. The other thing I would probably do is I would work on the uh, upper left-hand corner and clone that out as well as the stem that's running out of focus behind the uh, the main yellow flower so that it more closely matches the rest of the background. But I'd look at different cropping on this one. This one you might even want to square up. Putting things in the middle of the frame is almost always a bad idea. Um, not all, you know, almost always, 90% of the time. But technically, this is a, uh, you know, good and sharp. Tones are good. So with minor changes, I think you can go from being a good shot to being a great shot. And that's the end of class A. Um, I need to try to get rid of this bit here. I'm not sure how to. 
try that. Um, okay, thank you, Henry. We'll move on to <clears throat> class B, nature. Um, let me just... There we go. Sunrise by Brian Harthoff. Uh, nice shot. Looks like the Tetons, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's always fun to shoot there, if that's where we are. If if it's not, go to the Tetons. That's fun to shoot, too. Um, there's some shadow detail here that needs to be brought out a, a little bit more. Um, the lines are good. The sky exposure is good. It, it's a nice shot. The the thing that you really need to do with landscapes is you have to provide a point of interest that is more than than just the mountains themselves. Um, you, you need something for the eye to focus on. Um, and it's a problem with almost all landscapes, certainly not you know just this. Try to find something that immediately draws interest, the interest of the viewer. Right now, I'm kind of wandering all over, and that's true of most landscapes. So when I shoot landscapes now, I'm shooting them very differently than I did 10 years ago, well, 20 years ago. Um, and very rarely we'll just shoot a mountain uh, range because they, they're not enough to hold most viewers' interest. Um, so look around, try to find things a little bit different get down on the ground, change the angle, do all sorts of different things, uh, try different things to make them unique. Because the problem with landscapes is anybody that's going to stop at the same spot and point a camera in the same direction is going to get the same shot. So what is it that makes your image different? That's that's how I like to think of things. Why, why, why do I want to look at your image rather than a hundred others of the Tetons? So, uh, but it's a well done shot. Like I said, all these are good shots. Ocala Monkey by James Aguito. It's a well captured shot. The there's a couple things about this that um, one thing you could do is you the contrast range can be improved. You can make the image pop a little bit more on this one. There's, there's plenty of room there from a post-processing point of view to bring the monkey out. Um, the larger problem with this is the background. It's a very confusing background, and that's very tough to change. That, that's totally out of your control. Um, so there's not much you can do with that, but that, that doesn't help the overall photograph. Confusing backgrounds um, are exactly that. They're confusing. So my eye, your eye almost always goes to the brightest part of the image. And you know, apart from a little bit of highlight in the ear and one in the upper left-hand corner, the brightest part of this is the sky. So my eye is wandering around the sky and it's taking in the monkey, but the monkey's not necessarily the as dominant in the frame as they should be. Tufted Titmouse by Debbie Lewinson. This got first place. This is a great bird shot. This is just a wonderful capture. It's very sharp. Um, I love the motion in, in it. Uh, it's not a static uh, bird on a stick shot. Um, the backgrounds, the, the coloring is interesting. Um, I am picking up some patterning in the background. I'm not sure what that's from. I didn't actually see that before, so I might be on uh, something from Zoom, uh, truncating colors, but uh, this is a great capture. Thank you for not putting it in the center. On shots like this, you're almost always want to, going to want to be going left to right. So the bird can, you know, you're following it right on out. Uh, it's it's very nicely done. Bird in Flight 
Debbie Lewinson. This got second place. Again, a very nice shot. Uh, on this one, you needed a little bit more shutter speed. Um, you know, I'm seeing some motion uh, with it. You, um, I don't think it's a focus issue. I think it's a shutter speed issue. Uh, but great capture. We are doing a good job with that. Tough birds. And thank you for not shooting them on a stick. Um, and I will tell you, just a lot of people do, but I have never seen a bird on a stick sell. Just for your own, you know, when you're thinking about what to put in an art show or something like that. I'm sure it happens, but it's very, very rare. Something with bird in flight is much more likely to sell than a bird on a stick. And that's the official generic name for birds sitting on perched on trees. That's not something I made up. It's uh, an official classification, I believe, by the American Photographers Association of Crazy People. Vermont Tree by John Rutter. Very tough shot, interesting shot. Uh, you did a really good job with the processing. Working on snow is always hard. There's a couple of hot spots on it that you might want to take out. Um, you can use the patch tool. You might get away with the cloning, uh, but there's a look for those spots that don't have detail and see if you can't uh, move a little detail into them. But it. Overall, you did a really nice job handling the snow. Antelope Squirrel by Amy Langman, third place. Very nice shot. Um, <clears throat> this one, I, I kind of had questions in terms of uh, the composition. And by that, I mean, I think that this might improve with cropping out some of the extraneous um, background and perhaps some of the extraneous foreground. It's almost like there's too much information. As I look at it, that may or may not work because you know you get a sense of scale that you might lose. But I would play with different croppings on this. The scroll itself is is really nicely done. Um, and I think the the tones are very nice. It's, it could be a very pretty shot. You don't really add a lot um, with the rocks in the upper right hand corner and the upper left hand corner. So you might see what happens when you prop those out. Um, most modern cameras have plenty of pixels to crop with these days. So take a look at that and see um, if noise becomes an issue if you crop it in too far. The modern noise reduction techniques are outstanding. Lightroom's new um, uh, noise reduction algorithms on raw images is, is just phenomenal. Um, and there's a whole bunch of third party uh, uh, plugins that also do the same thing. So I think you have plenty of room to crop a little bit on this. Chincoteague Sunset by Amy Langman. Very nice done, very nicely done. Um, this one has some room for improvement, primarily in the shadows. And you can also make this one pop a lot more off the screen. Try to avoid uh, centering your horizon lines. Now, you here you're sitting there, you got good reflections in the water. Um, just, Try to move it off center a little bit. And you'll be better off. Japanese beetle, Tim Yui. Nicely shot. Um, I like that you cropped it down so that we're focusing on on the beetle itself. Uh, with with bugs, the the bugs and frogs almost need to be shot with a polarizer to reduce some of the reflections. Um, <clears throat> when you're doing macro work, that can be a royal pain in the butt because you're gonna lose two stops of light, uh, but you can also control the reflections off of their, their shields and their whatever they are. Um, particularly bugs like this, frogs, same thing. 
I almost always shoot with the polarizer on and hope they don't move. Orchid Spider After the Rain, Debbie Lewinson. This got honorable mention. This is a cool spider. Um, and it's the exposure on this is just about perfect. I like the fact that you know the the main thing that you want us to look at is in focus. A little bit more depth of field would be nice. Um, but it, it's it's a, a well done, well shot uh, image. I I love that you got the um, the webs as well as you did. They form good leading lines. Nicely shot. Nature Bird by Angel Rivera. So here we have the typical bird on a stick image. Um, and what really saves this for me is I love the, the background sticks coming up. And the, they just they match much, much better. I'd probably try to cut out a little bit of the bottom right-hand corner, uh, maybe make this a square. It also needs a little bit of work in the contrast. And I don't recall when I looked at the original image, um, you always have to have on a shot like this, the eye has to be in focus. There, It has to be crystal clear or um, the bird people who, who go out and shoot birds all the time will just dismiss it immediately. Um, so when you're in a competition situation, uh, if you have birders that are doing it, if the eye is out of focus um, and and not crystal clear, uh, it's not going to go very far. I love the background on this. There's more contrast. It's a good good shot. Chinkatik by Debbie Lewinson. The processing on this one, um, I, I think it was intentional. I, I don't know. Um, you know, when you're shooting egrets at Chincoteague, I think there's probably different ways of doing it. Um, it, it it's almost posterized, um, and I don't think it quite works for me. Now, that said, remember, I'm always wrong, but uh, make sure your bird is crystal clear and sharp. Uh, <clears throat> and in this case, it looks like the focus is, is maybe somewhere else. But Lanternfly Lunch by Tim Yui. Well, this is an interesting shot. Uh, and I wish they ate more of the lantern flies. <laughs> the there, there's parts of this that um to me it's kind of it, it's a great shot, a very well captured. It's kind of an interesting shot and in, in that I don't understand exactly what's happening um, in terms of the focus because the the, the lantern fly itself, the, where the yellow and black is, to me does not seem sharp. But the area to the left of it, where it's red, does. And the pincers uh, on the bottom right also seem to be in pretty good focus. The the mantis itself is is sharp. Um, so that one left me a little bit confused as to why it was a little bit blurry. Um, and it needs to be crystal clear and sharp. Now, saying that, that's really, really, really hard to do when you're in, in this close. So uh, hats off and good shot and nice capture on this one. And I believe that that is all for class B. Let me just double check that for a second here. Um, thought there was. Um, I'm not sure I awarded all the awards for that one. Hold on one second, Henry. Sorry. First, second, third, and honorable mention. No, we got them all. Okay, sorry about that. So we'll now jump to um, 
class A pictorial. Lake grasses, oh. lake grasses by Julie Stoffer. Interesting image. I like the way you're thinking. Um, I like what you've created with this. I play with the contrast a little bit more. I think that there's more that you can realize from this image. Um, and this is one that you just mess around with until you get what you want. There's no right, wrong, or in between on this one. You know, whatever you like. And if this is it, that's fine. Uh, there is more contrast. I think you can make it pop a little bit more. Sunrise in Provence, Vince Pellegrini. Oh, you actually saw sun in Provence? We were there and saw nothing but rain for seven days. Um, this one, uh, I like the shot. I think it could pop more. Um, I, I, I just, I think there's more that we could pull out of this image um, and, and make it work a little bit better. Um, the shot itself is great. The processing needs a little bit of help just to, to pop it a little bit. And that's that's true across probably 70% of these that you know they need to pop a little bit more. Valencia Splendor, Ivan Bub. This one doesn't need to pop more. This pops plenty all by itself. Um, nice shot, well well conceived. It's a I, I like what you've done with this. Um, I like the angles that you put on it. I like the the way it's been lit and the processing is good. Good shot. It points up. Dutch Bagley, this got first place. This is a spectacular image. Um, I would do nothing differently. Um, it's a beautifully constructed image. Processing and toning are really interesting. Uh, point of view is interesting. Um, building itself is interesting. Just a great image. Purple Dawn by Lee Reeves. Um, now, this is one that gets impacted heavily by personal preference. Um, I, I'm ha having uh, more and more of a anti-HDR uh, reaction um, as, I, as I get older. And I say that as I'm playing around more with really blown out um, saturation on a lot of my images. So it's not really that, it's just the, almost the cartoonish look of HDR <clears throat> that um, that just doesn't float my boat. This is a, a, a well shot image, but this is also one, and I, I think that this probably would have changed my opinion of it uh, in terms of awarding um, prizes. This is actually on the flat side um, for an HDR image. And, I I think I have this one marked, but you could pull out a lot more color. If you're going to go HDR or any, in any of the any of the genres like that, you know, um, just go all the way. Don't go halfway in between because it's not going to work. It's going to sort of leave you cold. Um, but well shot image, well shot image. Happiness. Hope and Memories, Karen Lay. Um, this is a nice image and, you know, it's a well thought out image and the photographer um, was trying to convey a message and I think uh, they did it very well. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a meaningful image. I, I liked it a lot. Pumped up. Dutch Bagley, this got honorable mention. Again, this this is a, a gorgeous black and white. Um, Dutch does great work. Um, and if you're on the line, uh, congratulations, Dutch. Really nice job with this and, and your other image. It's just, 
super nicely done. Abstract windows, Julie Stauffer, second place. This is such a fun image. Um, I have no idea what it is and I don't care. Um, and this is another one of those images that you could play all day with um, and come up with 9,000 different variations to, and they'd all probably work. Um, <clears throat> I might try popping the contrast a little bit, intensifying the colors. Uh, I could see, you know, 30 variations of this coming through and all of them being good. So I, I thought this was a, a fun, well-seen image. However, you did it. Cabin in the Woods, Ivan Bub. Um, this is this is very nice for for this style of image. Um, when we get into optical tricks, whether this was on a cell phone app or things like that, my initial reaction to it is always, "What is it?" Um, I I don't know. I, I tend to react negatively to um, cell phone app type images, whether this was done on a cell phone or whether this was done in Boris um, or one of the other programs. It's it just one of those things. This is purely personal preference. It's not my favorite style, uh, but this one is, is well done in that regard. Um, I think it would have been more interesting and, and kind of obviously would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible. But I don't like the roof on this. I love the center of it. I love the trees. The roof sort of breaks up the image a little bit. Um, but I don't imagine that they would have appreciated you taking off the building. So it is what it is. The Intrusion, Dutch Bagley. Uh, this is a, an interesting abstract image. Technically, it's it's fine um, and and very, very well done. The tonality on it is, is great. Um, it doesn't have as much meaning to me as the other ones do. It, it doesn't have that, you know, knock your socks off feel to it, but it's still a great, it's a well-constructed image. Um, as I'm looking at this, I'd like to see it rotated uh, 90 degrees uh, clockwise and see what that looks like. But it, it's a nice image. Well done. Tylenol and urea photomicrograph, Ivan Bub, and this got um, third place, I th think. Actually, I think. Um, Sorry, I think this was, yes, this got third place. Yeah, I I love um, uh, things like this. I mean, I, the world, the one thing that I don't think most humans appreciate is what the little world looks like when it goes to bugs. And when the super tiny world goes through a microscope, all of a sudden, you know, the universe expands greatly. This is a very cool shot. Um, I like all the little uh, darker pieces in it. They kind of look like people, airplanes, or anything else. And basically, you're looking at it going, what the hell is it? I think that this would have impressed me a little bit more if it popped a little bit more. There's so much color in here. I mean, it's just out to lunch color. And the design elements on this are very, very nice. I'd pop it a little bit more. And, you know, certainly if you're going to go to print, you want to go, you, you have to, you have to pop this more. This is going to flatten out badly on a print list, you know, and things like this are actually very difficult to print well. So it's going to take some work, uh, but it's a great image. Love it. And that was it for Class B Pictorial and our last group will be class, I'm sorry, class A pictorial. The next group and last will be class B pictorial. Turkey, 
by Debbie Lewinson. This got first place. Uh, this is not a turkey of a photograph. This is a really nicely done image. Uh, good texture, great color. Um, yeah, just really nicely done all in all respects. Wonderful image. Homestead by Brian Harthoff. Uh, we're going to talk about HDR and black and white in in a minute um, or in, in a while. Uh, there, this this could be improved with processing. I like this image a lot. The the fundamental problem I have with this is that it needs a little bit more breathing room around it. A little bit more space, especially in the front of the tractor. It is so dominant um, that you just, it, it almost feels claustrophobic to me. Um, <clears throat> so if you have it a little, you know, if you cropped in on it, I'd pull it back, pull the crop off. If you didn't, give yourself working room um, when you're photographing. The modern cameras, you can crop in without losing anything. So give yourself some room. Um, on the edges, it will help in terms of uh, correctly aligning vertical and horizontal lines where you're gonna lose something on the sides. Um, and you can always crop in a little bit. You can, it's much harder to crop out. Um, but it, it's an interesting shot. Door front glasses, Tim Huey. Uh, again, it's a nice shot. I like it a lot. There's, um, when you look at histogram on this, there's no true blacks and there needs to be on this one. So this one, I like the shot itself very, very much. The processing needs to pop off a little bit more. Ravenel Bridge, Jim Kessel, this got honorable mention. Um, this one I know we're going to take a look at because this is another one of those that you can really make it pop uh, the the gold. You just have to work it a little bit and and play with it until you get what you want. I, I like the lines. I like the way it was shot. Technically, it's well done. You have a little bit more that you could pull out of this uh, in terms of the processing. Uh, but you put yourself in a position that you have a, a great great shot the other thing about this that you need to be a little bit careful of is when you get vertical lines like on the right hand side uh, of the bridge make sure they are straight okay it's an easy thing to do um but just straighten out your lines from from the start architectural photographers and this would fall into kind of an architectural uh genre uh, will immediate rea immediately react to vertical, especially vertical lines, well, vertical and horizontal lines that aren't true, that aren't straight, um, because they should be. You know, in the old days, you would have shot this with the view camera. Everything would have been straight right on the negative, and you wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, since we don't use view cameras anymore, you have to do it in post. But nice shot. Well seen. Crayon Diamond, Tim Yui, and this got second place. Sorry, Crayola Diamond by Tim Yui. Cool shot, cool shot. Um, this is one that could probably uh, also benefit from intensifying the colors when you do that because of the neutral tones of the pencils. Um, or whatever, I assume they're pencils. Um, the colors can get a little wacky, so it, to, to really get it to work is gonna take some work, but um, you can make this one fly off the screen. Again, it's a matter of intensifying colors and depends on how much work you wanna put into it. A lot of images take a lot of work, even if they're starting out great to begin with. It's those last, the last 10% that's hard to get. But it's the last 10% that will sell your image, that will win the prizes, 
And if you if you don't put that in, um, in general, what's going to happen is the person that did put in the ten extra ten percent is going to walk away with the prize. Antietam Farm, David uh, Lobel. Okay, this one I know we're going to look at. There's a lot of I, I like the layout of it. I like the um, the composition of it. There's a lot that you can see with a very quick process, uh, some very quick processing that will improve this image a lot. Um, but it's a, it's a well shot image. You put yourself in a good position. Uh, to take it right into the next level with about two minutes worth of work. Calf's Nightstand by James Yost. It's a well-constructed still life. Um, a little bit needs to, the shadows need to be pulled up a little bit, uh, especially on the vase in the back. Um, it, it's an interesting layout. It's well shot. It just needs a little bit of extra in terms of post processing. The one thing that kind of befuddled me was the background. Um, it's I don't know whether that's a a studio background, and that's what's causing the the blotchiness. Um, I don't know that it works as well as it, it should in in this case. Uh, but it's good and sharp and and well well executed. Chasing the hat, Debbie Lewinson. The horse, the cowboy, and the hat are great. They're a wonderful capture, um, in all respects. They're good and sharp. Uh, I like the dust flying, the hat flying, the expression on the horse that matches the expression on the rider, where this one doesn't quite work for me is the background area. And I'm not sure at all what's going on. It almost looks like it's been glowed out with a with a glow filter softened down. But it's it's kind of kind of odd and I think it throws off the rest of the image. Um, there's an incongruity here that doesn't make sense to me. And I find myself looking back and forth trying to figure out what's going on in the background and missing what's happening with the horse. Your backgrounds are critically important. Action is, is fine. Uh, a main subject is fine. But if you don't have a good background, you don't have a shot. Recursive crowd by uh, James Aguito. Um, I'm assuming that this is, I forget what it's called in Chicago. Uh, this is a, a very, and if it's not this type of shot, everybody in the world is taking these. So when you take these, you've got to be looking and doing something a little bit different uh, to make it fly. Um, and there, there's some great shots with this. So that's what your competition is. Um, and it, it's it's well executed. It's a fun shot. It's just that on on iconic shots, the the competition level is so high that you've got to be doing something really different uh, with it. But um, it's a good shot. Innocence Gaze. Tim Yui, third place. Nice portrait, nicely done. Um, the only thing that I would, uh, I, it looks like there's a hair lighter in this case, a hat light. Um, the eyes are just showing up one light, which maybe that maybe that's what we're looking at. I'm not sure. The hat's a little hot. Like I said before, you're going for the hottest spot on the eyes are going toward the hottest spot and they should be going right toward the eyes. Instead, they're going to the cap. A little bit more shadow detail, especially in the shirt uh, and under the hat that I think would bring it out. So the shot itself is great. Uh, the expression is great. 
processing, you probably want to do play around a little bit more with it. Um, there, there's more that I should say, there's more you can pull out of it um, if you want to. And if you like it as it is, that's cool because it's a great shot. And that was the last of the uh, images. Um, as I mess up again. So um, they will be posted um, as a link in the newsletter and on the website, along with the score sheet um, and the recording of tonight's session. Harry, or, or Henry, thank you so much. Uh, if you would, um, uh, I'll stop screen sharing. Um, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll have um, people continue to be muted for right now. And Henry, if you want to screen share and then work on a few images, that would be great. Okay. Thank you so much for your um, uh, extensive um, comments on the images. Really oh. very nice. Well, I hope everybody disagrees with him. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Can Funny you comment. Something? Someone feels guilty having eaten turkey on Thursday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> After seeing this image. Don't. <laughs> Had turkeys running around in our backyard for years and they're nasty little things. Can you see my screen, Vince? I we can, yes. Okay. Um I have no idea. I will just talk this one through. Since we just mentioned this one, and most of what we're going to do, uh, I don't even think I'm going to go into Photoshop at all with this. I want to keep this simple because that's what most of the post-processing changes are, is they're relatively simple, relatively quick. Um, and th this to me is the part where you have fun. Okay, so let's go over to the develop. And I've already worked on some of these. This is this is the uh, the image as it was submitted, and this is what we get with about thirty seconds. And I can you just to make sure can folks see that change? Yes, definitely. Okay, so how do we do that? Let's just reset this. And on an image like this, the first thing I'm going to start with is throw in some dehaze. And that's going to take a fair amount of dehaze. Now I've brought my sky in. Okay, so <clears throat> that immediately starts to work better. I'm going to now pull my shadows up a little bit. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to pop the whites up higher. There's a difference between whites and highlights. Excuse me. So I'm going to pull this my highlights down a little bit, pull my shadows back up. And, and I think we also need to pull the blacks up just a touch. Okay. So that's all that was necessary to go from this to this. Now, what I would ultimately do is I would take this into Photoshop and I try to blend, I lighten this area just a little bit, this area on the roof, so that the panels met over here uh, in terms of tonality. And now you have an image that's going to print very nicely. And it's also going to show a lot better. <clears throat> and here now we can even pull up the whites even a little bit more. Down wax, and you're just playing around with it until you get the tonality that you want. And if we look at the histogram in the upper right hand corner, you could see that I'm just touching down here. The left hand side of the histogram is black, the right hand side is highlights. Um, if you go too far to the right, you're going to be blowing out your uh, highlights. 
If you go too far to the left, you're going to be blocking up your shadows. So <clears throat> on, on this shot, this shot probably would have, uh, well, I cannot absolutely say, presented like this, this is my type of a shot. And this had a really good chance of winning in this group. Um, so it's those little changes that make a big difference. The same thing goes for this shot. Okay. Um, let me just see. Okay, that's how we started. <clears throat> and this is where I ended up. Wow. That's quite a quite a difference. Yeah, but the, it really, <clears throat> that's the point, <clears throat> is that it's not quite a difference. Um, it, it's, it's dramatic, but it's simple. So here's our, here's our starting point. So we're going to go to immediately increasing the whites. Um, we're going to pull up a little bit of shadow detail. Shadow detail is important because it brings up some of the stuff in the water. Uh, might pull down the blacks a little bit. I don't remember exactly what I did. It, it doesn't matter. These are things that you just sit there and play with until you have what you want. And again, I'm going to pull down the highlights. And if we look up here, this is where the highlights are getting pulled back down. We popped them too far with the whites. But now we pull them back into to range, and we start to get something um, that we really like. You can bring it up. All those changes. This now becomes a totally personal thing. On this one, before I mentioned that I'd straighten out that line. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick vertical correction without paying too much attention for detail. And if you noticed, uh, okay. see how it's beginning to crop in? This is why you want to leave yourself some space on the edges. Because anytime you're going to use uh, either your vertical or horizontal uh, alignment tools like this, you're going to crop into the image a little bit. And just give yourself some extra room. The other thing you can do at this point is you can just um, decide to play with the saturation a little bit, saturate the yellows a little bit more, maybe the oranges, you pull them back. You have to find what makes you happy. Yeah, that's bringing out some sunset. See what happens with the reds. All of this is personal. And what I recommend that you do is we started here. And I've now changed it to this. This is where I would leave the image. I would then walk away from it. Tomorrow, I would come back and look at it and say, well, you kind of overdid it, dude. How about you you drop back a little bit? Um, but always let an image <clears throat> settle for a day because the change between this and this is so dramatic. You might say, I'm done. I can't do anything more. And then when you come back and look at it tomorrow, you might say, yeah, that highlight's a little bit hot up there. I need to fix that. Or uh, I need a little bit more shadow detail over the side. So give yourself some time and and work work through it. Um, so this to me pops off the screen much more than the original did. And you know it took what thirty seconds to do. The tractor. Okay. We can't do anything about <clears throat> the the tractor being so close to us, but we can make things pop off the screen a little bit more. And once we're done with this, I'm gonna, I want to show you one of my images because it, it raises an interesting question about black and whites. Um, the first thing I would do with this is I know that there's an engine here. I know that there's a transmission down in here 
and that there's some detail in there. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull the shadows. See? Now, the other thing that I'm doing, so now I now I see that there's an engine and, and that's all good. <clears throat> I'm looking at my histogram. I can see over here on the left-hand side that my blacks are really blocking up. There's way too much black. There's virtually no white over here. So I'm going to pull my whites up. And again, I'm going to pull my highlights back down so that we don't do it. And now we've gone from this to this with two quick movements. You can see I have to pull my highlights a little bit further down. Uh, and yeah, maybe I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I tried the haze, bring it back in. The sky is unnatural, uh, which is a problem. The other part that's a problem with the sky, and let's go back to see if it's there. It's there already, but it's more obvious here. A couple of things have happened. One is you can always tell when an image has been overprocessed when you start to see lines along edges. Okay, when you when you see that little highlighted line up there, that's telling you you've overprocessed your image. There is no going back. So you can't get rid of that easily. The other thing is my skies have grayed down too much up here. And right over here is really where the problem is sky-wise. So <clears throat> when you're doing, when you're playing around with an image like this. Make sure that you're saving a lot of different steps. If you're using Photoshop, uh, save the steps in between. Just take a snapshot of them. Save 18 different versions so that you can go back. Um, the cool thing about this, this shot is actually the house that seems to be tipping over. So you want a little bit more room overall to see this. So this image is very, very close to an HDR uh, if it's not a, a true HDR, which it might be. HDR almost never, ever, ever works in black and white. You're going to get 1% or less of images that have this much of a tonal range that actually work. One of the things that I've been thinking of is modern in the, in the old days when we were working with film, uh, Ansel Adams came up with his own system and he said, there's, there's nine zones, 10 depending on how you want to count them, ranging from absolute pure black to absolute pure white. And everything else in there in the middle is shades of gray and they're delineated um, in seven or eight different steps. With modern cameras, what we have is we don't have, and, and that that was a, you know, it, it's not like it was linear, you know, just chunks, nine different chunks. There was certainly, um, you know, blending between the zones. So you could have a zone 3.6 or 3.8, but film does not have the same dynamic range as modern digital cameras do. So if you're going to start to do black and white, which has a long history of what is good and what is accepted within the industry, and you're using a digital camera, you have to think a little bit differently. You have so much dynamic range in, in a camera, um, today's camera, that you can create HDR looking images without doing HDR. They just have too much and I want, it's not really micro contrast, it's almost like micro zones. There's just too much information that you have available um, to you. So, and I'm going to flip over for a second. We'll come back to this. Uh, works, works. This is a shot that I took. And one of the things that I did was I said, ah, this is very different than what the original looked like. Obviously, the original is in color. But the more I looked at this shot, the more I decided I didn't like it. And the reason for it is, 
is that the tonal range within the image is there's there's just it's too wide it doesn't represent what i think black and white should look like based on on my knowledge of black and white my opinions and one of the things that's missing is as soon as this just doesn't look real to me it looks it looks hdr even though it's not <clears throat> very much like the tractor so what i'm going to do in this case is i'm simply going to bring the shadows back down and now most of the image is back into the range of traditional black and white photography. The exceptions here would be his face and his hands and the woman, probably her hair. So what I would do at this point is I drop my shadows by 61 points in Lightroom, whatever that means. I'm not sure what it means. What I would do is I would actually do this in Photoshop, and I'm not I'm not going to do it simply because <clears throat> I'm afraid we're going to screw up the zoom. I would pull down my shadows, and then on the entire image, and then reinstall the original file or the original tonality that I just had onto his face and his hands. And when I did it this afternoon, I said, "Oh, I actually like that image." Yeah, so I went from liking it, saying, this is awful. Why did you ever even think this was good? That's the waiting a couple of days. And now I know the way back. I have to take it back so that it is more as more of a traditional black and white feel to it. Um, Henry, can you explain for the group what taking down the shadows mean, the comment that you've made? Well, let's. Okay, so right here, this is this is as as I finished the image the first time. <clears throat> Let it sit for a couple of days. I really like the story in this image. <clears throat> and basically, it's just, you know, when I shot this, when I shoot things, I am thinking of a story. I often name my images before I take them. So I know in my head um, what I'm trying to say. And to me, it's interesting because here you have a young woman on a cell phone and an old guy feeding the pigeons and the generational differences are extreme, but they're both doing exactly the same thing. They're just both sitting and waiting and letting life go by. So <clears throat> that's the first thing I do. The second thing here in terms of bringing down the shadows is if I bring up my shadows, increase the amount of uh, detail in the shadows, this is what it looks like. Okay. And then all I'm doing is in, in Lightroom here is I'm moving my shadow slider. What I needed to do to make it look more traditionally black and white was reduce this so that my tonal range in the shadows is more limited. I don't, <clears throat> if traditional black and white photography can give you you know, a hundred different uh, mini zones to produce the image. A digital camera today might have 500 or a thousand mini zones. And it just provides too many points of light to represent traditional black and white photography. Um, because what we're doing actually is we're technologically, we're taking a step back. A digital sensor is much more sensitive than any of the films made ever were. Um, they just have a greater range to them. So <clears throat> by pulling my shadows back, what I'm doing on the digital image is I'm reducing my tonal range, um, or actually reducing the dynamic range, I guess you could say. Um, it, it, it's kind of a murky subject because I, I haven't really talked to anybody about this yet. Um, this shot occurred. This this shot has caused me to do some some thinking uh, about different things. But what you're trying to do is you're trying if you're doing black and white, you're generally trying hard to duplicate a feeling that has been uh, kind of a constant in in photographic art for 50, 60, 80 years. Um, 
and and that that's more limited than what we can do today. So just a thought. So don't, don't you don't want to HDR your stuff. It's basically what it comes down to. Um, that's where were we? And and that's what this one does. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is just too close to HDR uh, for black and white for my liking. Skies generally aren't gray like this. When you have heavy patches of gray, it's probably not a good thing. This should be closer to white. You can make this work. Uh, it's a great scene. It, it's a very strange, uh, very strange scene, but it's it's good. Look at how much more detail we have in there. Um, you see the difference very quickly. And again, if you're going to print, this is this is what you want to be printing off of, not this. Because your prints are going to flatten down and you want something that's going to pop off the walls. This doesn't pop. All of this on a print, even on a good modern printer, you know, a, a high-end printer, this is all going to block up when you go to print. This is going to block up. You need you need that extra space in there, so it's going to so it's going to work for you. We'll go to class B. So. Um, So this is this is as as it was sent in. You can bring your greens up. It's going to be a more lively image. Um, and all this is doing, let's just do a reset. The first thing with what happens is you can see right in here that these are your shadow details and now you're losing it. It's going into black uh, in your shadows. So those highlights, those shadows rather, are blocking up. So you wanna loosen them up a little bit. And it doesn't have to be much, but you immediately, with that one thing, you've now improved the, pic the photograph tremendously. Um, the rest of it's a little bit harder, which is typical of landscapes. And let's bring the highlights down a little bit so I can bring my whites up. And might want to dehaze this a little bit. As soon as you use dehaze, which is a valuable tool, you almost invariably want to bring up your shadow detail again. Greens are tough. As soon as you bring them up, now you've probably brightened them too far. So you might want to take down your vibrance just a little bit. It's not going to really affect anything up here. And in short order, you've gone from this to this. Now, the photographer might say, I hate this, and that's fine. But you know, give yourself some options when playing with this. You don't want your, your, your shadows blocking up like this. That presents a problem to you. The monkey is uh, also a more of a problem. We can't do anything with the background, but we can do something with the monkey to make him pop off the screen a little bit more. So that's that's what a quick edit does with that. Go from that to that. And all this is is a matter of using the haze. That's going to pop it. Bring your shadows back up. Bring your whites up a little bit more, drop your blacks, and you know we're we're literally doing virtually nothing, but you're making an enormous change. See the difference in in how uh, what's right? <clears throat> there's just a brilliance to this image. Now, in this case, what I would also probably do is I'd probably probably play around a little bit with the clarity. 
See if I can sharpen the fur just a touch. You have to be careful. Too many people use clarity too often. It's something that only on rare occasions will I use. When you're creating an image, I, I talked about having a base image and having a digital image and then having a print image. The one thing you don't want to do is on your base image, you never, ever, 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 ever want to sharpen it. Don't sharpen your base images at all because the sharpness for a digital screen is different than the sharpness for a print. Um, and whether you're using clarity, whether you're using sharpness, whether you're using uh, a custom program for that, it is always the very last stage. And the reason is that the way they're doing it is they are adjusting the micro con uh, contrast on the edges of, um, of identifiable regions. So in this case, the micro edges are going to appear right here on the fur. If you go and you do that early just to make sure you're sharp and then start applying other filters to it, you are magnifying that sharpness and it's very quickly going to get out of control. Do it always as the last step. So, and now we go back to Chincoteague. Excuse me, um, Henry, there was a question. Um, should you be doing these changes on the entire image as opposed to perhaps using a mask to select out, which I guess you were skipping because of time. I'm skipping that because of time, yeah. Um, and it also gets a little bit complicated to follow. What I do in general is I use Lightroom for two purposes, three purposes. Um, one is as a catalog, just so I can see my images. Number two is I will go through and I will make gross changes um, in Lightroom that apply to the entire image. And the third thing I do because it's easier and better is I will do my uh, geometric co uh, corrections in Lightroom. They're, it's simply better than, than Photoshop. Um, and both of them are Adobe Camera Raw. I have no idea why they are different, but they are. Um, so for getting the, the cataloging and the adjustments, the ge geometric uh, adjustments, what I use Lightroom for is very quickly being able to see where, where I need to make changes. On an image like this, what I would do is I would make some of the, the uh, the gross changes in Lightroom and then bring the image right into Photoshop and start working on specific areas. So if we go back to the truck, for example, that we had uh, a minute ago, I would have done a lot of that. I would have done some of that in Lightroom and then brought it into Photoshop and I would have worked on the engine compartment uh, specifically. The reason for doing that, and, and I could do it all in Photoshop, but it's nasty to try to do that, excuse me, all in Lightroom. Virtually impossible to do it in Lightroom in any reasonable fashion. And if you'll excuse me for a second, I think I'm about to sneeze. Um, so what I would do in this case is my first, my first immediate reaction, assuming this is the way I, it came out of the camera, which it wouldn't be, um, is I'd look at this and say, ah, shadow detail. There's no shadow detail. Um, so my first step would be to immediately bring that up. And interestingly, then I would bring the blacks back down. I would probably bring the highlights down just a touch. I would look at dehazing it, which immediately, you have to watch dehaze. Dehaze is your best friend and your worst enemy all built into one. Um, I would reduce the vibrance just a little bit. Might pull up saturation a little bit. But that's where we start. So in 15 seconds, that's telling me that the image has potential. 
and that I should work on it. I would now bring this into Photoshop and I would bring out, I'd work the, the shadow detail in here, bring out some shadow detail there, maybe a little bit here, and I would darken this down and I would try to work this line so that I could see more shadows in there. But what I would do is, you know, this tells me that it's available. So by stretching my shadows all the way out, I could say, yep, I got room. I can get in there and I can take care of this. Yep, there's detail in here. I can see that. So it's it's both a quick check and a quick edit. Um, I don't particularly care for Lightroom. Um, no, I'll change that. I fundamentally hate Lightroom. I think Adobe has screwed up in so many different ways. Um, they they just keep making the program worse and worse and worse, uh, and they don't care. You know, all they want to do is do their iPad and iPhone, and you know, you can do Photoshop on your your iWatch now. I think I don't know. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to fix the damn program so that it works, and most of that is in the cataloging. Um, but three times today, Lightroom just decided, eh, I'm tired. I think I'm going to stop working. Um, and I've had it with it, but I don't have a better option right now. So uh, I use it for doing things just like this and then plop it into to Photoshop. I do most of my work in Photoshop. I do almost all my work in Adobe Camera Raw. I do it in multiple levels. Uh, I'm very bad at, uh, at, I use layers all the time. I'm very bad at saving my layers. I work flat a lot. Um, I'm not doing a lot of compositing, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I do simple stuff. I, you know, th there's a lot of very complex things in, in Photoshop. It just, uh, and I'm guessing I know five or 7% of, of Photoshop. I'm convinced that if I learn any more, my head's going to explode. Uh, so I try not to. My idea, you know, when I'm shooting, when I'm processing, the idea is not to master Photoshop. To me, the idea is to create photographs and I don't need all the extra stuff. But that's where we started out. This is where we started out. And that becomes a, a more dynamic image. Go back to the library. Give me one sec. Uh, HDR. Now, this is obviously a very colorful image, but within the framework of HDR, not so much. You know, there's there's a lot more that you could do with it. If you're going to go, you know, super colorful, then go super colorful. And I can look at my histogram and I can see where part of the problem is because I don't really have a, a true, true black and the whites are, are questionable. So for this one, I'm just going to start by pulling the whites up and pulling my blacks back. And I'm still within range. My tone down the highlights just a touch. A little more black, throw in some dehaze, pull up the shadows. See, I'm not doing anything very complicated. And that's, you know, I don't think a lot of this stuff needs to be complicated. You guys are doing a good job with it. Just take it, you know, one half a step further and you're going to be golden. That's what it looks like to start. That's two minutes or 30 seconds difference. So that one pops off the screen. The other one is, is kind of flat. And here's a situation where I would certainly spend a lot of time in Photoshop okay? and working with individual brushes. Um, and you could, let me just see something. Uh, Can you see this in Photoshop now? 
You're not in Photoshop yet, Henry. I saw your brush. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah, You're still in light. Huh. Well, anyway, because that will take a long time. So on what I would do in this case is especially down in here, I would just go into Adobe Camera Raw. Raw. I'd pop the white uh, slider over and I'd brush in here. And that will bring up the uh, the coloring, the white on, on these various uh, levels of the building. I might try to bring this up a little bit. Um, and I, I would work this a lot. I'd probably drop these back down in terms of black. And those I'd be doing all with an individual brush. So this one would be totally in, um, uh, I do all of this in Photoshop. I would just say, that's where I take this immediately into Photoshop, do one gross edit, and then probably 30 or 40 individual edits. And you can make this thing fly off the screen. Print this on a high resolution or a, a high gloss paper. Um, and it would be very, very slick. But the point is, with this one, is if you're going to do this, go all the way, and don't stop halfway where you're kind of thinking, eh, it's HDR, no, it's not HDR, I know it's HDR, you know, just go for it. You know, this, I think, was one of yours, Vince. Um, yes. Okay, so the, the problem I have right now is this this building needs to be more dominant for the for the scene to work. So I'm going to pull my whites a little bit. I'm going to pull my shadows a lot, and then work my blacks back down a little bit, and try to pop that off a little bit more. Um, this is one where you know. You might have to work with the vibrance a little bit or, excuse me, with the saturation to come up with what you envision, how you're trying to duplicate the light that you saw. Uh, and it, it really just depends on what you wanted to create. But <clears throat> that's what it starts with. Oh, I'd already played with this a little bit. That's why it's screwy. Let's just reset it. Um, yeah, you have to you have to watch um the vibrance only as soon as you get into the golds and the yellows, you have to to watch the vibrance uh, and and play around with it. But you need this building to be a little bit more more dominant because that's that's a major part of the scene uh and as it stands it just it sort of sits there and the the overall image is, is kind of flat uh at least to me um so that's and we're going to go to nature Let's go to this one. So that's how it started out. And that's what's possible with a little bit of work. Um, and this will print and notice the, see how flat that is versus yes. that. This is what you want to be displayed. Uh, Maybe not exactly this, but again, it, it's all I did, and you can't really see it, but now I'll, I'll do the changes. Um, it's simply a matter of playing with the sliders in Lightroom or in Photoshop. In this case, I can see in my histogram, I'm always looking at my histogram. That's my base point. The first thing I look at when, when I'm shooting, if people if, who have shot with me, um, know that I will look at the back of my camera. 
Um, but I'm not chimping. I am, you know, I know what I've shot. I've just seen it through the viewfinder. What I'm doing is I'm checking my histogram. And that's telling me whether I'm good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so with this one, I know I have no whites. I know I have no blacks. So it tells me I have a lot of room. So I'm going to pull the whites up. I'm going to drop the blacks down. I'm going to play with the haze, after which I play with the shadows. And then you just keep going back and forth. Get there, drop the highlights a little bit. Uh, change the vibrance. And it, it's simply a matter of you deciding what you want, how you want your image to look. Um, gonna pull the blacks back down a little bit. And this is one I would do in Photoshop, certainly. So there, there's no right or wrong on this, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your image pop. So here, here it's technically, you know, we're um, compositionally, it's a great image. Now, it, now it is a great image. You're going to have to work a little bit on the greens and things like that. But we're not doing anything exciting. We're not doing anything that says, oh, I have to spend uh, two hours listening to how to do this in Photoshop type of thing. We're just playing with those very basic controls to pop your image off the screen. And this is not a bad place to start for a print. Well, it, it, it's a little bit too, as your base image, it's a little bit too flat. Um, but it, there's just so much of a change that could be made. It just, uh, to me, there's there's a lot of room. Was that one of yours, Vince? Yes, and I fully agree with you. Thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna hit you a second time here. Um. So this one is, is a great image. Again, you know, I'm looking at this. The blacks are right at the edge. The whites are good. Uh, this white area right here is actually this. So there's snow on this is this part of my histogram. And I know that just from experience and I can see the little peaks. So that tells me I have more room to play with the whites. So I'm gonna bring the whites up a little bit. That's gonna affect the clouds. And I'm gonna bring down my highlights. Most important on this one is I'm gonna bring up my shadows a little bit. I'm gonna get a little bit more detail in the rocks and the mountains. This is very close to being a great image from a processing point of view. Just needs a little bit of help. If I bring up my dehaze a little bit, I'm going to darken up those skies. Uh, let's see, maybe bring the blacks. On this one, what I probably do is burn in this over here. But <clears throat> that's what we started with. And I'd already changed it. I forgot to reset it, but um, so I, I think that you can make this one pop a lot more too. See the difference? Indeed. Yeah. And Good. now this one is going to print. This one is going to, when you print this, it's going to muddy up uh, because these highlight, these shadow details right in here in the blacks are going to start to blend together and there, there's not going to be enough uh, of a differentiation, um, which is why it's sometimes hard to be talking about prints versus digital. Um, and I would say this one's not, because I didn't start fresh on this one. There's, there's other changes that I would make and do it a little bit differently. But the point is <clears throat> to try to get it off this, the flatness and bring out the detail. <clears throat> and you wouldn't think that a, a shot like this, you could do the same thing. But what I want you to watch here is how we can isolate the bird and give it more of a three-dimensional look. Um, starting point right here is that there are, there's obvious shadow in here, but it's not going to show up. So we're going to bring the shadows up a little bit. I'm going to use the haze to drop down that sky darken down the sky a little bit. I'm going to bring the whites up to pop a little bit more there. 
my highlights are close to being blown. So I'm going to bring them down, <clears throat> which also affects the sky back here. So um, I try a little bit more of a dehaze and a little bit more of a shadow. That's our starting point, and that's there. Now you might say, <clears throat> oh, the sky's too blue. And oftentimes, especially if you're dealing with the haze, <clears throat> the sky will be too blue. You just go down to your saturation <clears throat> and reduce the saturation of the blue to whatever you want it to be. Um, you could increase it, but not a good idea. Maybe a touch down a little bit more. But something, this, this as good as this shot was, <clears throat> we can um, we can change it, and it just pops off the screen more. Henry, question um, in the chat, um, kind of related to the last one. Um, how about using the masking in Lightroom for uh, subject versus sky versus background? Do you use those, or do you just go do that kind of work in Photoshop? I do it in Photoshop. I mean, I, I just, my assumption with Lightroom is going through that nothing is actually going to work. Uh, and that's been my attitude toward Adobe for the past couple of years. Um, and we have a neighbor who's a, a, um, uh, a, a graphic artist. Um, and I think she's gonna take up arms against them. I really do. You know, if, if there's ever a mass shooting at Adobe headquarters and I find out it's her, I'm not going to be at all surprised. <laughs> um, but I I don't need to do it like that. Uh, when I'm when I'm working an image like this, I'm going to work the the whole the whole image individually in in Photoshop. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I can make I can make gross changes here. But I also can make very subtle changes in, say, this side. You know, you've got a glacier over here. Um, glaciers tend to be grayed out. So I might make this part of the, uh, the image a little bit whiter than this side. We'll bring this up not <clears throat> so that the, they're balanced a little bit better. The grays are a little bit different here. I would probably go in and work on this area just a touch to try to bring a little detail in. May not be able to do that and have it look right, not sure. Um, but I, on almost all my images, I'm working on individual segments. Uh, you know, it's, and, and I'll go back and forth. Uh, I just go in and out of Adobe Camera Raw. Um, and the way I have it set up is I've just got uh, um, keystrokes set up so that each time I go into Camera Raw, I create a snapshot. So if I screwed it up, I can just go back however many steps I need to go back and, and start over. Um, but I, there's images where I've been in and out of Camera Raw 30 or 40 times. And to me, that's the fun part. The fun part to me isn't letting um, Photoshop determine, make decisions for me. That, that's my job. Um, I don't know, it's personal preference. And the other thing is I'm getting old and I don't want to learn too much more. So when <laughs> they come up, well, you know, I know, I know what I'm doing. I, I find it relaxing, um, you know, it's, I no longer am in a situation <clears throat> where, you know, I've got to turn out 400 images from an event that I shot this afternoon. And there I would use Lightroom ex exclusively. Um, so, you know, if it takes me an hour to, uh, to create an image, I, my attitude is, you know, that was a good hour spent. I had fun and I probably should, most of my images are three or four hours long at this point. You're just working and back and forth, seeing the potential. 
<clears throat> well, this has been really wonderful, uh, Henry, and quite a, an educational experience as always with you. Uh, the comments in the chat have been great. They've loved your work and your instructions. So thank you. Well, do you want to open it up uh, and yes. have people ask? Do that. If you stop screen sharing, um, people can unmute. Um, we have the folks at the Goggle Works. We have lost a few folks um, as it's gotten a, a little later. But um, just as an FYI, Henry, um, uh, we have you, I have you penciled in for November 25, 2024. <laughs> Okay. I'll send you the email. Um, so uh, anyone want to comment to Henry? If you want to come off uh, mute, you're welcome to do so. Um, I certainly I'd like to I'd like to thank Henry. He always gives such a great um, informative presentation, and I loved listening to you and your ideas on how to process and thank you. You're welcome. The one thing I, I want to say is the processing is one <clears throat> minor aspect of, of the entire process. What people really need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here, is, is focus, don't focus on complicated processing. You know, some of the processing with masking and stuff, you know, you can sit there and watch a three hour video on how to change colors to do whatever. Uh, <clears throat> But the most important part of the, the image <clears throat> is what you shoot, what, <clears throat> what your base image is. What are you trying to say? Photography for a lot of people is uh, a, a vehicle for personal expression. So think what you want to say and then create those images. And it doesn't matter how you create them. And if it's, if it's conveying um, what you want to do, then great. Um, I have an image that I think I'll post on Facebook tomorrow <clears throat> that I, I just had. Uh, it was a, a Halloween display. And it, and I wanted to create, they, they put a skeleton type thing in a birdcage. So by the time I was done thinking through this whole thing, I, I now have this goblin that's trapped in a have a heart trap and maybe this isn't such a good idea to leave them out on Halloween because you might catch these things. So there's a whole thought process that um, many people consider absolutely mental, but that's how I think I'm trying, when I, I have an idea in my head, rather than clicking a picture, I don't, I no longer take pictures. I, I create images in my head and then try to do it with the camera. And I fail miserably most of the time. So failure, <clears throat> when they say failure is not an option, that person is not a photographer because you could fail a whole lot and get away with it. Henry, do you have any workshops coming do, coming up? I haven't heard any announced recently. Um, I haven't thought about it too much. <clears throat> I've been doing uh, a lot of writing. Excuse me. Um, a lot of writing lately, and that's occupied a lot of my time. And I think we'll do something in the spring. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, but was never really a shore person. But now find the shore to be absolutely fascinating um, from sort of a. Uh, it, it just, I, I don't understand the New Jersey shore. I don't understand vacationing at the New Jersey shore. I don't understand anything about it. So I find it fascinating to try to figure out, you know, visually what's going on. So I may do something down at the shore. Um, I think that would be fun. If you do have some workshops uh, coming up, uh, let me know and I'll pass them around to the members uh, through our newsletter, et cetera. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, the ones I've done with you have been extremely good for me. Got a comment here. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Hey, Bob. Uh, okay, I'm live. All right. Vince, yes. I just wanted to let Henry know that one of the things that really struck me tonight 
And I don't know why this just jumped out at me, but just to take a look at your image and then to let it go for a day or two and come back and look at it and to just reanalyze it. That really spoke volumes to me. So thank you very much, Henry, on that. You're welcome. Um, and the reason is that the changes that you can make quickly are so dramatic that you think that you've gotten, you know, all that you can get possibly get out of that image. Um, but what you're really doing is now creating a new starting point. So your starting point is so much further ahead, you could see the little details and stuff. And it's something that's done that I do all the time and I, I try to recommend it to everybody. So I'm glad that it's helpful. Terrific, thank you very much. Yeah, that was Marshall. And Marshall, um, when Henry showed me what he was doing just then, I said, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? It was the, it was the relooking. Um, they were brilliant changes, Henry, um, that I just missed. We all do. We just, you know, I I've gone back and done images that um, I did ten years ago that I thought were great, and I'm looking at them going, you know, you really screwed that up, dude. <laughs> um, and when and most of the changes. To, to the images, if you've got your cropping right and you've got your uh, compositional elements in there, they're easy. They're, they're not very time consuming and little things um, can be very useful. I want to stress one other thing. Exposure is critically important, but it's not something to stress over. And by that, I mean, we, we've done a number of trips this year. And one of the things that I've taken doing is I know what aperture I want to use. That's, that's not ever the question. You know, that's when I shoot, the first thing I do is decide on my aperture. So I'm, I'm deciding how I want my background to be in relation to my foreground. I don't want to think if I'm traveling, um, you know, to a place, I don't want to spend 20 minutes thinking about the exposure. I right, just bracket. Yeah, you know, just put it on high speed, bracket away, and don't even think about it. So I know I'm going to have an exposure that's usable. Um, you know, the base has been done, the aperture has been determined, and I don't want people to be thinking in terms of this being a a, a highly technical um, type of thing. They just get the basics down. I mean, I spent years with, you know, uh, spot meters and calculating out which developers and, you know, how long I had to do this and that. I'm taking it the easy route. And the reason for that is I'm trying to create an image. I'm not going to be, I don't want to say technically perfect, because this gives me the opportunity to be close to perfect without having to give it a whole lot of thought. Concentrate on the um, on the shot you're taking, rather than the the technique or the technical aspects. Right. Okay, Henry. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you guys. I hope you have a great rest of the year, and um, everybody sign up to the club. <laughs> thank Before you. Your deadline. Good night, Henry. Good night. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.